All right, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first thing, if um, oh gosh, I'm just, my mind just totally went blank. <laughs> um, so we're going to try and do this uh, steering committee meeting via WebEx this year for obvious reasons. Um, my name is Jeremiah Poling. I'm the uh, information resources manager at the Angelina Nature Authority, and I'm here with uh, Carla Etheridge, our Clean Rivers Program Manager, and uh, Allie McElroy, our wildlife biologist, and also uh, Kimberly Wagner, who is our uh, communications director. And we are um, glad to have you with us. So we're going to... Um, try to keep everybody muted as we do this, and uh, if you have a question, then please use the chat box or the raise hand feature in WebEx, and we'll try to um, get to those questions as they come up. So... All right, so steering committee meeting, same, uh, same stuff that we've had up on the screen as we've been going. If you have a question, please use the chat box, and, um, and we'll try to get to those questions as they come up. We've got a pretty full slate today. We're going to try to get through this as quickly as we can and get to uh, questions. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Our agenda, like I said, our agenda is pretty full today. We're going to have um, a little bit of an introduction from me, and then Carl's going to take over and talk about our Clean Rivers program, and then we're going to have some updates um, from some special projects that we have going in the basin and some conservation updates that are also some related special projects, and then we'll have a question and answer at the end. So talking about ANRA first, ANRA, the Angelina and Natchez River Authority, we are the river authority that covers um, most of the uh, Natchez River Basin. We partner with the Lower Natchez Valley Authority, has three counties in the lower part of the basin. For the purposes of the Clean Rivers Program, uh, we cover from about uh, the top end of VA Steinhagen north in the basin, and the basin goes up uh, just above Tyler. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, let's just skip over the COVID-19 stuff, everybody knows that. So the Natchez River Basin um, includes uh, the counties that are highlighted here on the map. ANRA's jurisdictional portion of the um, basin includes uh, everything except for the three counties that belong to LNBA down in the lower portion. All the counties there you can see listed, I'm not going to read them off. Uh, ANRA is generally, we consider it a three-way split um, that we do. We have a, an environmental division, uh, general administration, and an operations division. Uh, our general administration division is coordination with governments and other entities. We also do water resource planning and development for flood control and for um, drinking water and things like that, and we also do bond issuance or projects that are related to that. Our field operations division operates um, water and wastewater treatment facilities, and we also have a composting facility outside of Jacksonville that takes um, biosolid sludge from wastewater treatment plants and turns it into compost. Our environmental division, we have the Clean Rivers Program. We also have an environmental laboratory that um, analyzes our samples for our field operations division, for our Clean Rivers program sampling, and also for local municipalities and uh, private individuals. And we also are the permitting authority, the TCEQ designated representative for on-site sewage facility permitting for Angelina County and the portion of San Augustine County that is within the Natchez River Basin, which is about 90% of San Augustine County. And we also uh, are the permitting authority for 
a 2,000 foot buffer around Lake Sam Rayburn that we call Control Zone Rayburn. And that uh, includes Angelina County, Nacogdoches County, uh, San Augustine, Sabine, and Jasper counties. The you can I'll go over here. Let yeah. Carla have it from here. Um, like Jeremiah said earlier, I'm Carla Etheridge. I'm the Clean Rivers Program Manager here at ANRA, um, and I'm just going to give you a few updates. Actually, I think this is your part, but I'll go. <laughs> um, so the Texas Clean Rivers Program was established in 1991 by the 72nd Texas Legislative Session. Um, our purpose, or the, the program's purpose, is to monitor the waters of the state and maintain or improve the water quality. It's funded by fees on wastewater discharge and water rights permits. And it's um, in collaboration of the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, and 15 other partner agencies with an emphasis on the collection of water quality data for assessment and regulatory purposes. Okay, so the uh, FY20 and 21 budget allocations are as follows. Um, in the blocked portion, that's ANRA and LMBA, we split equally um, for each fiscal year. So ANRA's Clean Rivers Program budget by category. This is just a split and a breakdown of where those monies go. Um, and this is for FY 2018 through 2021, we had a project extension through TCQ to extend the 2018-2019 project and extend it through year 21. So. Right. So we normally, uh, when we do these budgets, we do them on a biannual basis. And we would have done an FY 20 and 21 budget, but TCQ had some additional funds in the uh, FY 18-19 budget year and they were able to give us some additional funding to put towards uh, laboratory equipment and uh, education and outreach stuff that we were trying to do. So we, instead of creating a new contract, we extended the FY18-19 contract through 21. And you'll also, if you're doing the math, you'll see that additional funding reflected here versus what was in the, the previous slide. So. Okay, some updates to ANRA's water quality monitoring and the 2020 Basin Summary Report. Um, this is a segment watershed, so the segments in the uh, Upper Nature's Basin. So these are broken down, 605, 606. Um, these are just the different segments we cover, 610, Sam Rayburn. Um, so currently ANRA monitors 37 sites quarterly and we do that for field parameters, conventional parameters, and bacteria. Um, additional monitoring in, in the Upper Nature's Basin is performed by TCQ Region 5, which is in Tyler, and Region 10 in Beaumont, as well as the uh, Lower Nature's Valley Authority, which is LNBA in the southern portion of the basin. Um, and just here in this chart here, you can see uh, the different sampling entities and um, how many sites or sampling stations there are. So for field, ANRA has 37, conventional 37, bacteria 37, and then because the reservoir is only 29 of those have um, flow measurements performed. And those are the following for the other sampling entities as well. FY21 um, water quality monitoring changes. So we aren't changing any of our stations per se, but we're now collecting um, Corfield A samples at all of our monitoring stations, and that began FY20. Yeah, I think that's right. So that'll continue into FY21. ANRA um, also began collecting TKN at all 37 monitoring stations as well. Um, and we're working on bringing in the Corfield A and the CO5 analyses in-house in order to um, kind of control the costs incurred due to outsourcing these analyses and having to ship those out. Okay, this is a map of all the sampling sites in the upper portion of the Nature's Basin, um, starting from BA Steinhagen um, and Lower Nature's Valley up. So we have like TCEQ Region 5, um, SFA purple monitoring sites over here. Our monitoring stations are in blue. And we also have TCEQ Region 10 in here as well. Yeah, and the pink ones are special project monitoring sites. 
So this is the water quality monitoring um, stations that we have currently. Um, and this is just a station description. It kind of mirrors that map on the previous page of the blue. And um, so we have two 24-hour dissolved oxygen that we monitor as well. So at Biloxi, at County Road 216, excuse me, and Riverine portion of Sam Raver, we do 24-hour monitoring on those for dissolved oxygen. Um, the 2020 Upper Natives Basin Summary Report is now available on our website. You can use this link down here at the bottom to, um, to view that. Um, the report is prepared every six years and provides a comprehensive overview of the water quality in the Upper Natives River Basin. So for this report, we looked at um, 161 different sites and 212, I mean 212,405 data points were assessed for this report. Um, so just a little bit of a summary about what we found in general historical and current water quality of the Nature River Basin um, includes elevated bacteria levels. So with the elevated bacteria levels, these are, these are common um, impairments that are generally not from point sources. And we have projects in progress that are attempting to address these impairments. And um, future projects are also in the planning stages for those. Uh, depressed dissolved oxygen, um, that's common in our basin as well. And you can see in the table, it, this is going to mirror the table right here to the right. Um, depressed dissolved oxygen, with that, a site can be listed on the 303D list for grab samples. So, uh, but in order to be taken off the 303D list, you have to use 24-hour monitoring, in which we're trying to do that with two of our sites now. Um, so we also have for dissolved oxygen impairments, we have Cedar Creek. So this low dissolved oxygen could be due to a misclassification of the stream. We're actually looking into that now. Um, it, right now it's classified as a perennial stream, but the portion being monitored, monitored is really intermittent with pools. So we're in contact with TTQ now to try to, to get that um, situated and reclassified. Uh, so Piney Creek TCQ just completed a, a UAA, which is a use attainability analysis, and is looking to reclassify to a lower aquatic life use standard. Um, like I said earlier, we're conducting the 24-hour dissolved oxygen monitoring on Biloxi Creek and the Angelina Sam Rayburn, I mean Angelina River slash Sam Rayburn Reservoir. Reservoir. Tier is um, conducting 24-hour monitoring on Kickapoo Creek. So they're doing that. And then uh, other impairments that we have in the basin are the mercury and dioxin, dioxins in edible fish tissue. Um, that would be for Lake Palestine, not Lake Palestine, Nature's River below Lake Palestine, um, Lake Ratcliffe, uh, Sam Raven Reservoir, and then the Angelina River where it ties into Sam Raven Reservoir. So there are um, fish consumption advisories out for those portions. And then we also have um, quite a few concerns for nutrients in the um, basin as well. And for trends, there are, um, for these parameters, bacteria, we only have one decreasing trend. For nutrients, we have uh, three increasing in the basin and 45 decreasing. So that's a positive, looking at all of these nutrients here. And then for dissolved oxygen, we have one increasing trend and one um, decreasing. And you can see here, this is all the trends in the basin. Um, throughout the entire report, this is all the trends that we have. So we have quite a few um, for decreasing in nutrients, which again is a positive, um, in most cases a positive. Uh, we have quite a few pH and specific conductivity trends as well. And um, you can look in the report and find out more on, on these trends. They're more broken down of, of what could be causing those. So that's the Basin Summer Report update. Now, just a quick update on what we've been doing. Um, some additional resources for this. You can check out uh, TCQ Clean Rivers Program website here. Um, the Swickham Procedures Manual is there as well. And then our QAPP 
our monitoring activities on the AMR website, and then the mo actual monitoring schedule you can find at the LCRA website. Um, does anybody have any questions related to the summary report or our monitoring activities? If you do have any questions, please use your uh, raise hand feature so we can get or you in the chat. or in the chat box. Questions? I can move on to Kickapoo Creek. All right. So we were going to have Leah Taylor from TIER do a presentation on the project that they have going on Kickapoo Creek, but she was unable to uh, get signed in. So we're going to we're going to go through her slideshow and fake it for you. <laughs> Jeremiah and myself are going to try to tag team this one and give you a good overview of, of that project. So, um, go ahead, Jeremiah. The, uh, the Kickapoo Creek watershed is impaired for bacteria, similar to a lot of the other watersheds in the area. There was an, a recreational use attainability analysis performed in 2014, and the conclusion of that report was that the primary contact standard was still appropriate for that water body, which means that the bacteria levels should be below 126 um, MPN for the geomene. And so that has led up to this uh, characterization, which should hopefully lead into a watershed protection plan in the area. Um, we're going to, I'm not familiar with this slideshow, so I may be repeating things that come up later in the slides, but we'll just go through it and we'll we'll see what it says together. <laughs> um, the project is a partnership between TIER, the Angelina Nature River Authority, and the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. Uh, right now they are, let's go to the next slide and see what we got. The Clean Water Act, which is where the funding for this project is coming from, uh, EPA does this funding through the Clean Water Act, and they funnel those funds down to, in Texas, they funnel them to the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board and to TCEQ. Um, this particular project is funded through those funds that went to the Soil and Water Conservation Board. And the um, goal of the project is to characterize where the water quality issues might be coming from on this water body and start to set up um, education and outreach and stakeholder groups that could lead into a watershed protection plan to try and address those impairments. Um, there are two different impairments on Kickapoo Creek. There's the bacteria, uh, which we measure by the indicator bacteria E. coli, and then there's also some dissolved oxygen impairments. Um, the recreational use attainability analysis that I've mentioned in 2014. Um, yeah, we talked about that already. <laughs> Routine monitoring at nine sites. They're basically collecting the same parameters that we collect for the Clean Rivers Program, ammonia, TSS, VSS, nitrate, nitrite, uh, TKN, phosphorus, total phosphorus, BOD, and chlorophyll. And they're conducting 24-hour monitoring at three of those nine sites. Uh, to try and um, see if the if the dissolved oxygen is still an issue, or if it was just the grab sampling that um, that was causing that. So, a map of the sites: Kickapoo Creek is uh, just north of Lake Palestine, and there have been a couple of meetings held to date. I think one of them was held in Brownsboro, which is there at the southern portion of the watershed on the map. Um, monitoring has been going uh, well, I believe. We the uh, they've had to change the the monitoring procedures a little bit due to the COVID-19 stuff, but none of the monitoring events have been missed. Everything is still going on schedule. It, we just had to adjust a little bit of the handoff procedures and things like that for the sampling. A uh, list of the sites, the ones in purple here are the 24-hour DO sites, but uh, the, all the other parameters are being collected at all of the sites. What else? Data. Um, 
E. coli at the bottom in purple, flow at the top in green. The scale for the flow is on the right and the scale for the E. coli is on the left. You can see it looks like um, there's a slight correlation between lower flow events and higher E. coli, which would um, indicate some concentration in the streams. I don't know. There's not enough data there yet to make any strong conclusions. And I've never seen these graphs before, so. <laughs> I'll go to the next one. <laughs> Same thing here, um, E. coli in purple. And of course, you can see the um, in the two different dashed lines. The primary contract PCR is primary contact recreation. That standard is at 126, and then secondary contact one would be if the streams had been reclassified during that RUA. That would be the standard they would be trying to hit. So you can see they're not too far off from being able to hit the primary contact. Uh, it is entirely possible that some um, community involvement and management could could get these to a point where they would meet the standards. So that's encouraging. Next. The. These are just different flow levels from different periods of the year. So she's just portraying the different yeah. levels. So it still shows you the same data. Same data, yeah. So yeah, okay, there was the first stakeholder meeting was held on March 3rd. 12 people attended and had questions. And those questions were answered. I think Carla and Allie and I were both in attendance at this meeting, and it was it was a pretty good meeting. Okay. Yeah, there was quite a few in attendance. There was a lot of discussion. A lot of good. discussion, yes. <laughs> Excellent. So next, they do have a website put up. It has a lot of this data on it. It's at kickapoocreekwpp.com. Um, and they are working on a proposal for a full-blown watershed protection plan. And work's ongoing. Okay. Um, if you guys have any questions about the Kickapoo project, you can ask us, uh, or you can contact Leah Taylor herself at um, the contact information below. I think now we're going to turn it over to um, Anna Gitter with TWRI to give us some um, Middle Nature's updates. Yes, let me see if I can get this all set up for us. So, okay. So yeah, so I'm going to give you a couple updates on some projects that we have out in the um, Natchez River Basin. Uh, specifically, the tributaries of the Natchez River below Lake Palestine, so um, over those, as in as well as the Angelina River. So, for the tributaries of the Natchez River below Lake Palestine, um, it's a mouthful, a lot of words, so we usually just call it Middle Natchez. Um, and this one is very uh, local to Lufkin. So, from left to right on the screen, this watershed includes Jack Creek, Cedar Creek, Hurricane Creek, and Biloxi Creek. And these tributaries are impaired for elevated uh, concentrations of bacteria. They're all designated for a primary contact recreation one, which um, as was mentioned previously is a standard of 126 colony forming units per 100 milliliters. Um, and the way this watershed is delineated, it's a, it's a little different, but it also includes the two upper um, unimpaired uh, segments of, or assessment units of Cedar and Hurricane Creek. And the watershed, as you can see, includes Lefkin, but it also includes the city of Hudson. So just some overview characteristics. Um, so it's entirely located in Angelina County. It's um, 92 square miles. Um, around 42,000 people live there. Um, and then there are three uh, permitted entities in this uh, watershed, um, two of which discharge municipal wastewater. Um, that's Hurricane Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant with the City of Lufkin and the City of Hudson's Wastewater Plant, as well as Georgia Pacific Chemicals, which treats industrial um, wastewater. So um, this is our second year in this project, and uh, we've done a watershed characterization, and now we're working in the technical support document. Um, and so with that, we've looked at historical water quality in the area, 
And um, the graphs that are on the left side of the screen, uh, the ones on, I guess, the far left, left so Cedar, Hurricane, and Jack, and then the um, bottom right, Biloxi, those are the impaired um, assessment units in the watershed. And you can see, you know, that trend of elevated concentrations of E. coli over time. Uh, we do have a fairly robust data set here. It dates back about 20 years. So um, have some good data to work with. And then on the right hand side of those graphs for Cedar Creek and Hurricane Creek, those are the unimpaired assessment units. Um, and then the map in the far right corner, that's gonna show you um, those monitoring stations and where they're located in this watershed as well. Um, and then according to the 2020 integrated report, which is what you know TCQ is using to kind of gauge, you know, um, the impairment in the state of Texas and these water bodies and um, all these tributaries, as I mentioned earlier, are elevated above 126, but they're not, um, not, not crazy high levels or <laughs> however else you want to say that. You know, I do think uh, these concentrations are, uh, they're high, but there's something that we can work with and I think we can try to address. So, um, as I mentioned, we're working on the technical support document, um, which would feed into a TMDL. We just had a public uh, meeting via Zoom last Friday and um, trying to gauge, you know, whether it's just going to be a TMDL or if, you know, there's a stakeholder interest to also do a watershed protection plan. So, we're still trying to identify that, but um, we plan or hope to have a draft TMDL um, completed by um, later this year, early spring. And so far with this project, we've had those two public meetings. One was in last November, the one we had last week, and then likely we'll have another one this fall. Um, the format in which that will happen is to be determined, but we're still, you know, we're kind of working through the, the technical side of this project right now. And this was a TCQ project, and we're working with ANRA on it, um, and they've been super helpful. So, uh, but moving on, we are Angelina River above Sam Rayburn Ray Reservoir. And this one we've been working on actually for a couple of years now, um, I think since 2017. Um, and um, this project keeps getting extensions, so we're still kind of in the characterization side of it. Um, but according to the 2020 Texas Integrated Report, there are four segments that are impaired for not meeting, again, that primary contact recreational standard for bacteria. Um, and that includes the main stem of the Angelina River, and then East Fork, and then Mud Creek and West Mud Creek. Um, there's also concerns for elevated um, levels of total phosphorus, nitrate, and ammonia. Um, and the graph on the, or not, sorry, graph map on the right hand side, um, I don't know if you can kind of see, but uh, circled in red are the uh, impaired, or, yeah, the impaired um, segments that we're looking at in this uh, watershed. And so we've actually, uh, with an extension, um, continued monitoring with a focus on the upper portion, which is mud and West Mud Creeks, which are just south of Tyler. And so on this graph here, you can see which uh, stations were in the original project for the first year of monitoring that we did. Those were the purple ones. And then in blue are the extension sites that we're continuing our monitoring for, which will go on, I believe, for at least another year um, to kind of get a better idea of what's going on in uh, this watershed, especially in those areas. Also, Tyler. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're still kind of in the characterization side of this project, um, collecting water quality data, developing that report, getting a better idea of what. Um, it, the water quality is looking like, like in this watershed. Um, we hope to start stakeholder meetings um, later this year, early spring. Um, again, format for that will be um, to be determined, but you know, hopefully maybe in person. And then um, when this project wraps up, we'll, we'll have that characterization report with additional data analyses from Mud and West Mud Creek. And then from there, kind of decide what our next step will be. And this was a project that's funded by the Texas State Soil Water Conservation Board, and again, Anne is a partner with that one. So, and, um, if you do have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Anna Gitter. I'm a research assistant with TWRI. And then um, Dr. Lucas Gregory, who will also be presenting today, um, he's a great resource as well. So feel free to reach out to us, or um, and we'll try our best to answer your questions. 
Um, if anybody has any questions for Anna, you can go to your chat box and, um, and be sure to ask there. Um, if not, we're going to pass it on over to Lucas Gregory, Dr. Lucas Gregory, for his presentation. Thank you, Carla. We can get everything switched over here. All right. I think we're good to go. Okay, so I'm actually going to be presenting on a couple of different uh, projects and uh, a couple of different watershed areas, much like Anna did. Uh, the first one is going to be on the Atoyag Bayou. Um, this is a watershed protection planning effort that was started uh, about 11 years ago now. It's hard to believe it's been that long. So uh, time flies when you're having fun, I guess. But nonetheless, this this watershed protection plan was developed um, by the uh, Atoyag Bayou Watershed Partnership, and it was finally accepted by EPA in the spring of 2015. And basically, since then, we've been on the path of implementing uh, that watershed protection plan. So the project updates I'm going to be giving today are all about the implementation side of things. Um, but before we get into that, uh, just to highlight what the plan was all about, uh, just like the same uh, issues in other water bodies, uh, several segments of the Atoya or assessment units of the Atoyac Bayou were impaired for elevated E. coli. And much like every other watershed in the great state of Texas, the sources of the bacteria were everything with hair, fur, and feathers. Um, so the watershed protection plan uh, focused on those potential sources of E. coli that were relatively manageable. Uh, and those uh, primary sources were septic systems, uh, livestock, and wildlife. So all of the implementation efforts that have been done thus far have focused in on those uh, three main sources of, of E. coli coming into the watershed. Um, but this is a, a multi-pronged effort uh, that's, that's uh, Pretty large in scope and has certainly uh, withstood the test of time thus far and has resulted in a lot of good implementation efforts uh, on the ground there in the Atoyac Bayou. But it's certainly one that has uh, required the engagement of, of multiple folks there locally and, and certainly uh, from multiple partnering agencies, uh, of which the River Authority is, has been one of the big ones. Uh, so has Stephen F. Austin, uh, the Piney Woods RCND and the Nacogdoches Soil and Water Conservation District as well. So without those partners, uh, a lot of this work would not have happened. Um, so on to the actual implementation projects, and, and these are current projects that are ongoing now. Um, the first one I'll talk about is titled the WPP Implementation and Water Quality Monitoring Project. It's very original, I know, but um, we're scraping the bottom of the barrel for project names, I guess. Um, but anyway, the goals of this project are to keep the watershed stakeholders engaged and up to speed on what's going on in the watershed. And also to continue having discussions with them about what needs to be done, uh, where it needs to be done, and all those good things. Um, and then to evaluate the watershed protection plan milestones that have, were outlined in that watershed protection plan. So basically looking at our implementation targets and evaluating how we have done relative to meeting those targets. So the key items that we've looked at there are the number of septic systems that have been repaired and replaced. And I'll touch more on that here in just a minute. Uh, the number of water quality management plans that have been implemented, uh, efforts uh, regarding feral hog management, and then changes in water quality over time. Um, this program has also continued to deliver uh, education and outreach activities and programs uh, throughout the watershed and, and in nearby areas. Uh, oftentimes our education programs are not actually in the watershed, but that's more of a function of logistics than anything else, uh, just because there's not really a good meeting facility uh, anywhere in the watershed. So oftentimes we end up in Nacogdoches or Lufkin, which are not too far from the watershed. But anyways, the, the main goal of this one is to actually do uh, the water quality monitoring work and keep tabs on things. So for the water quality monitoring aspect of this project, um, Stephen F. Austin, uh, has a team of students primarily that is led by Dr. Uh, Matt McBroom uh, out of the College of Ag and Forestry there. And they are monitoring water quality monthly at five locations across the watershed. So 
most of the or four of the five sites are on tributaries of the Atoyac, and then one is uh, kind of southeast of Garrison uh, in the upper end of the Atoyac Bayou. Uh, and basically, the the primary goal is to evaluate bacteria levels uh, in the stream, uh, but they're also looking at other water quality constituents as well. So uh, this monitoring has been ongoing for a number of years, and um, it's basically highlighting what's going on in the uh, in the watershed from a water quality perspective and but it is critical to evaluating the success of the watershed protection plan and i will say that uh, at one point we had a delisting for one segment of the atomic bayou uh, but regrettably during the next assessment of water quality by tcq uh, that water body uh, failed to meet the water quality standards so it was a, a small win uh, and certainly a step in the right direction but uh, basically, it highlights the fact that the work is not done yet, and um, there's still a lot left to do. So, uh, nonetheless, we'll keep on monitoring and uh, keep on evaluating that water quality over time. Um, the next uh, project that I'll highlight is one that the Nacogdoches Soil Water Conservation District uh, operates. Uh, this is a program to develop water quality management plans. Uh, for agriculture and forestry operations in the watershed. Uh, so basically they have a uh, technician there at the soil water conservation district office that works directly with uh, individual landowners uh, to talk about uh, their specific uh, operations, whether it be livestock or, or forestry. Uh, they talk about the goals and objectives of the producer and then uh, they match those goals and objectives up with um, appropriate conservation practices or management practices that they can implement to improve the utilization and management of the resources that they have available and all the while improving off-site water quality. So uh, really the goal is to reduce the E. coli loads coming from these areas uh, and oftentimes that gets done by implementing practices that allow the landowner to better manage their livestock resources uh, or minimize runoff coming from their property. So uh, oftentimes this is relative to livestock water, especially if a uh, operation is currently using uh, a creek or the bayou or something like that for a primary watering source. It might be that running a water line or putting in a water trough or something like that uh, is appropriate and, and can certainly have some positive impacts on water quality. Uh, prescribed grazing is another common practice that gets implemented here. Uh, and that's basically all about managing the utilization of those grazing resources so that you don't have overgrazing, uh, which in turn leads to increased runoff whenever you do have those runoff producing rain events. Um, so basically that's what it's all about is just uh, better utilizing the available resources and minimizing the, uh, uh, I guess, downstream effects uh, of management on that land. The, uh, I guess the biggest implementation effort that has been ongoing uh, in the Atoyac Bayou is the septic system remediation and replacement program. Um, and this one actually was started long before the watershed protection plan was accepted by EPA. Uh, Angelina Nature's River Authority began the program uh, using some funds from TCQ that uh, they needed to get spent down. Uh, and they basically started uh, repairing and replacing septic systems in the southern end of the watershed and in a, the, their management zone around Sam Rayburn. So they got the ball rolling. And then from there, uh, TWI has actually led two separate projects to repair and replace septic systems. So the first one uh, wrapped up and, and uh, I think I'm getting ahead of myself, but anyways, so the goals of this are to reduce E. coli loadings through septic system repair and replacement, uh, and then also to provide education resources to watershed stakeholders so that they can better understand the proper functioning and maintenance of their septic systems. Um, so oftentimes the septics don't become a problem for a landowner until the toilet doesn't flush or something like that, but it's not quite that simple. So uh, the one of the primary goals is to provide those education resources to get the word out about uh, what a homeowner needs to be doing to properly care for their septic system. Uh, but basically, through these programs, we use funding from uh, TCQ, from EPA, uh, and through the state supplemental environmental program uh, to repair and replace uh, septic systems across the watershed. 
Um, so in the, the first project that is, uh, or the current project that's ongoing, uh, the goal is to repair and replace 15 systems. Um, if not more, uh, sometimes we can secure some additional funding or uh, have systems that don't cost as much to repair and we're able to stretch the dollars a little bit farther. Um, but basically, uh, this project is ongoing. We've got our uh, first set of bids in, uh, I think for the first eight um, repairs or replacements, uh, and then we'll do another round probably next winter. We'll send out another request for bids and, and get that second slug of systems done. Um, in the previous projects, uh, we replaced 24 systems. Um, so we're up around the, the 40 to 50 mark for the number of systems that have been replaced in the watershed. Um, so it's pretty good, pretty good success thus far. And uh, it's been a, a good leveraging of resources. Like I said, we were able to secure some supplemental environmental program funding for a number of those systems. And just because we had that project ongoing, we already had applications in hand that were ready uh, to basically have a, a shovel stuck in the ground and dirt be turned. So uh, we were able to get that done really, really quickly and uh, have addressed a lot of high need situations. Um, one of the things that uh, is, I guess, uh, pertinent to mention is that the average income or average annual income of the recipients for these septic repairs and replacements is about $23,000. So whenever you think about the average cost of replacement being $6,500, uh, it's pretty easy to realize that um, a, a, a household that's only bringing in 23,000 is not going to be able to uh, take care of that repair replacement on their own uh, in the vast majority of cases. So it's been a very beneficial program, um, not only to the residents, but also to the environment uh, and to in-stream water quality. Um, so the, this program is ongoing and uh, Piney Woods RCND has uh, been a, a, a critical partner in this program. Uh, they do the boots on the ground work and, and Ken Autry there at the RFCND has uh, made a lot of good inroads uh, with residents around the area. And it's really uh, been spread a lot by word of mouth. So once you get one system go in, then neighbors hear about it and kind of takes on life of its own. Um, but anyways, that effort is ongoing and we're actually uh, just, or we actually just did turn in a continuation proposal uh, to secure funding for hopefully another 21 failing septic systems. Uh, the demand for these has not slowed down any um, over the course of the previous projects. So uh, we're going to see if we can't get some more money to, to keep the ball rolling there uh, and, and get more, um, I guess, uh, systems in the ground. Um, one thing we are going to do differently in this uh, proposed project is to do direct mailings to all uh, watershed residents that have septic systems or are expected to have septic systems at least. Uh, so we anticipate uh, doing quarterly mailings for a year to about 6,000 residents across the watershed. And that's basically going to be information about septic systems, proper operation and maintenance, and so forth and so on. Um, so hopefully that will get funded and we'll be able to continue those efforts. Um, the other project proposal that's uh, in the works is going to be to continue that implementation, facilitation, and monitoring work that I mentioned earlier. Um, so it'll be very similar, uh, but just to continue that work on uh, so we can continue evaluating the uh, water quality in the basin and the level of implementation that's been ongoing. So I think in a nutshell, that's all the updates I had for the Atoyak Bayou. Um, any questions uh, relative to that? So, Lucas, I think if you want to go ahead and go with the update, that'll be fun. All right, let me switch gears. Get that presentation pulled up. All right. So, moving, I guess, up the basin just a little bit to the Lanana Bayou. This is a Another bayou there. Um, well, it's actually uh, adjoins the Atoyak Bayou. Uh, it flows to the city of Nacogdoches, and I'll show you a, a map here in just a minute that illustrates exactly 
weird, but basically this is a, a smaller um, tributary of the Natchez River that yet again also has a bacteria impairment uh, and does not currently meet the primary contact recreation standard. So um, at this point, all three assessment units of Lenana Bayou are considered impaired, uh, but there are also some concerns for elevated ammonium, uh, nitrate total phosphorus uh, at least in the downstream portions of the watershed so um, we have done a characterization project on this watershed already we partnered with the river authority uh, a couple of years ago um, put in a project proposal to the texas commission on environmental quality and secured some grant funding through the clean water act um, program that they have there and basically what we did was we kind of did a desktop review of the watershed and, and what's going on out there. Looked at the uh, existing water quality data and actually had the, the River Authority do some more intensive monitoring there in the watershed. Uh, so we did uh, routine monthly sampling uh, and then we also did some high intensity work as well. So uh, that took place in two phases. Initially, we did what we called an exploratory sampling where we monitored uh, 25 sites on a single day, just kind of in a shotgun pattern across the watershed where we could get easy access. And we use that to identify some potentially problematic areas within the watershed as far as E. coli concentrations were concerned. So we came back later on, and I'll talk more about this later, but we came back later on with a round of investigative sampling um, where we basically prioritized certain areas of the watershed based on the results of the exploratory sampling and then went and collected 75 samples on a single day so we could see if there were any further hotspots that were identified. So I'll present that information here in a minute. Uh, but basically that was the, the, the big thrust of that initial project was to really get a better handle on the water quality and to start building the information base to work off of going forward. Uh, we all also did have some discussions uh, with some key stakeholder and stakeholder groups. Um, and generally speaking, there was uh, local support to develop a watershed protection plan. Um, so using that feedback from local stakeholders, we um, put together a project proposal to move this thing forward to next phase and actually develop a watershed protection plan. But before I get to that, uh, let me show you a little bit of data. So here's the watershed you can see that um, here in the middle of the map uh, is the city of Nacogdoches. So basically it, it goes all the way across the watershed from left to right and the bayou flows pretty much right through the, through the middle of it. Um, the water quality data that has been collected um, over the course of time is presented there and those graphics on the left. Uh, and you can see in the, the table up top, just the data that was collected during our characterization project uh, shows that there are considerable E. coli concentrations uh, in portions of the watershed. So in the upper portion of the watershed, water quality is above the water quality standard, but relatively better compared to the other two downstream sites. Um, in the heart of town there, um, is where we saw the highest E. coli concentrations during our one year monitoring stint. Uh, and then farther downstream water quality improved, uh, but it was still well above that primary contact standard of, of 126. So obviously some, some bacteria concentrations that are not where you would want them to be. Uh, and looking at the graphics on the bottom uh, there, it illustrates that this has been ongoing over time, so it's not uh, a recent issue. Uh, and in fact, the trend lines are pointed in the wrong direction from what you would want them to be. Um, so definitely a, a good candidate to address some water quality issues. Um, and just in talking to watershed stakeholders, there are some other concerns as well. Uh, flooding in town uh, has become more of an issue over time. So uh, that's honestly the local stakeholders biggest concern. Uh, water quality is playing second fiddle to those flooding concerns, but uh, things that can be done to address uh, flooding issues or at least manage uh, flood risk also have positive water quality effects. So there's some um, uh, mutually exclusive benefits that we can get out of, of this for the local stakeholders. Um, so I mentioned the exploratory and investigative sampling uh, earlier. So the map on the left side of the screen 
is that first round of exploratory sampling or monitoring where we did 25 sites uh, all in one day. Um, I think we did these within a couple of hours. So we had a team of folks from ANRA and a team of folks from TWRI. We split up and uh, divided and conquered there and did the sampling all in one fell swoop. Um, so basically we started at the bottom of the watershed and worked our way up so that we did not uh, generate any potential disturbances in the stream by us getting in there and tromping around or anything. Uh, but you can see the water quality was uh, generally above the water quality standard. Um, the differences between the first two categories might be hard to see on your screen, but the only site that had a E. coli concentration that was within that water quality standard was in the very upper end of the watershed. Everything else was above the water quality standard as we got farther downstream and closer into the city of Nacogdoches. So um, you can see the, the red points there certainly do um, stand out. Uh, they were the highest concentrations that were observed uh, during that monitoring event, but it's not any one specific area. So based on that information, we went back and, and kind of looked at things and, and decided that pretty much the whole watershed warranted uh, another look to see if we could hone in on where some potentially problematic areas uh, might be. So we did the investigative sampling and that's uh, depicted there on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, now, one difference to point out is that uh, the exploratory work was done in May of 2018 and the investigative work was done in December of 2018. And um, one point we did want to do or, or to, I guess, capture within that monitoring is that we wanted the student population uh, that is there at SFA to be in town? So we did this during finals week, uh, both years, um, so that we could still capture the bulk of the student population. Because much like most college towns, whenever school is not in session, the population drops significantly, and um, the potential sources of E. coli also uh, decrease as well. So we wanted to capture those uh, during those monitoring events. So, but one is in the warm season, one is in the cool season. So that certainly could have had some. Um, bearing on what we saw as well um, but just due to the amount of time it takes to evaluate the first data set and plan for the second collection we weren't able to get it done and in, in within like the same uh, time period i guess you want to if you want to call it that so in the second monitoring event um, generally speaking water quality was much better across the watershed you see a lot more uh, points within or, or actually meeting that water quality standard of 126, which is a good thing, um, but it really didn't help us identify those potentially problematic areas as much as we thought it might. Um, now that said, there still are a number of, of sites that are out there that, that exhibited some elevated E. coli concentrations. You can see that a number of them are clustered together. So this tributary here on the Eastern side of the watershed is one that has several higher concentrations in it, uh, but it, by the time it gets down to the confluence of the bayou, it goes back within the water quality standard. So um, no smoking gun there, if you want to call it that. One thing to note, though, is that the main stem of Lanana Bayou, which runs north and south through Nacogdoches, um, all of the samples that were collected on it were well above that water quality standard. So. Um, there's certainly something going on in there. It's just one that we haven't been able to put a, a finger on just yet. Um, but this was good information that shows that it's a distributed problem across the watershed and not uh, just a specific area that is causing the issues or anything like that. So good information nonetheless, and it'll certainly be uh, informative for the future watershed protection planning um, that is uh, about to ensue. Um, so. Moving on to the next steps, um, a project proposal was submitted to TCEQ to go ahead and develop a watershed protection plan uh, for Lenana Bayou. Uh, this application was turned in last summer um, and was selected to be funded. Um, TCEQ and EPA are still um, doing the things that they do in preparation for those projects to kick off, but our anticipated start date is somewhere around September 1st. Um, it just depends on when the contract comes in and everything gets signed, but it will be starting uh, somewhere around that date. Uh, from there, our initial goal is to 
kick back into gear and, and, and re-engage the stakeholders that we've talked to over there and to actually form a watershed stakeholder group that will be tasked with providing input and um, basically guiding the development of the watershed protection plan. So we're again working with the River Authority and Stephen F. Austin on this project. Um, and, and we will collectively be working to facilitate the stakeholder group and develop that watershed protection plan. And the goal is to have a plan developed and accepted by EPA uh, somewhere around the 2022 mark. Um, that's fairly ambitious, but we think with the data that's already available, we'll be able to get the stakeholders up to speed and push things into high gear and go ahead and crank out a watershed protection plan uh, to address those bacteria sources. Um, just like every other bacteria uh, issue in the state of Texas, it's going to be the same large suite of bacteria sources that are out there. So we're not going to have to recreate the wheel or anything, uh, but basically just work with those stakeholders to adapt things uh, to best fit there locally uh, and get them documented in that watershed protection plan. So that's really the goal of this project moving forward. And um, like I said, it's going to kick off here in the next few months. Um, hopefully we'll be able to start it with in person meetings, but we'll see. Uh, we'll go with the flow as as we have been for the last little while. Um, project support, I mentioned this, uh, that it was, or, or this new project will be funded by TCQ uh, with EPA Clean Water Act money and um, Andrew Stephen of Austin and the Water Resources Institute are the, the project partners that will be pushing the work forward. Um, and if you have any questions about that, you can con contact myself uh, at the information there or Emily Monroe, um, she is going to be our program coordinator for this one. Uh, she also coordinates the Atoyak Bayou uh, implementation efforts, and she would have given that presentation today, but she's currently on vacation uh, enjoying our coastal water resources right now. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions that y'all might have, um, and I will turn over the screen back to Carla, I guess. Yeah, that's fine, Lucas. Um, <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? You can uh, send those in the chat box. Um, we're going to kind of switch gears here, um, but before we do that, I wanted to give a shout out and a thank you to Lucas's group for uh, the special project updates. And I was going to shout out Emily, but um, now that she's enjoying her vacation. Yeah, it's not pretty hard <laughs> right now. <laughs> uh, but she does. She does a lot of work on those Atoyak projects for sure. So we definitely want to thank her as well. Um, so switching gears here, we're going to go into some conservation updates. ESA threatened species. And I'm going to go ahead and get that pulled up um, and introduce to you Allie McElroy. She's Andrew's wildlife biologist. I'm going to scoot in a little bit so that we're by the, the speaker here. Um, so I just have a couple of updates. Thanks for hanging out with us through this. Um, ANRA is really leaning into the conservation and mitigation of endangered species. So we're part of the East Texas Aquatic Work Group, and it keeps us in contact with the Texas Comptroller's Office and several other river authorities in Texas. Um, we're also keeping up with a couple universities, Stephen F. Austin and UT Tyler, that are doing work on species and um, working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Um, so the species that we're focusing on right now are species that are currently threatened in Texas and they're candidate species for federal listing. Uh, so two of the species that we're uh, keeping an eye on are two of our freshwater native mussel species, the Louisiana pig toe and the Texas heel splitter. They're both currently protected in Texas and are both candidates for federal protection. Um, the Kind of where we're at in that right now is the species status assessment has already been drafted by Fish and Wildlife Service. So that means that um, a petition has already been gone through. They've already decided that these species need at least a closer look to see if they need protection. And at this point, now that the SSA has been drafted, they're basically going to decide whether or not to list those species. Um, we are still keeping up with the SSA. We've submitted our comments and everything after reading through it. And we're keeping up with a couple of the other river authorities that are still active sampling for these species. Um, so the reason we're up with these 
uh, species in particular is that both of them, uh, their ranges lay in our nature's basin. They extend a little bit out of it, but they both um, are completely within our basin. So the Texas, or sorry, we're going to start with the Louisiana pig toe. Um, so the map here, green means that the condition, the current condition of the populations is estimated to be good. Um, the darker the color, the worse the population condition is estimated to be. So if we look at the Angelina River and Natchez River, which are both in that light blue portion of the map, the Natchez River Basin, um, the Natchez River is actually where they think the best candidate for the best populations are right now. Um, and that part of the Natchez River, the upper Natchez River, is completely within our basin. Um, once you get down to the lower Natchez, their estimates are not so great. Um, but if you look at the Angelina River, the overall condition is considered to be very low, and that is based on abundance. So the chart there at the left shows how U.S. Fish and Wildlife decided the estimated condition. We don't. Oh, sorry. I think we're getting some questions, and I'm supposed to be in charge of the chat box, and I'm supposed to be presenting. I don't think they can see your screen. No, there, there's. It's not showing on your computer. Oh, I've just realized that you can't see my PowerPoint, so give us one second. Okay, so now we can see the PowerPoint presentation. So these are the muscles we were talking about. There's the map that shows that they both lay um, in the Natchez River Basin. Sorry. Um, Here's that map I was talking about with the green showing the population estimates to be good and the darker colors showing that the population estimates are bad. Uh, the table at the left is the factors that are contributing to that estimate. Um, so if you look at the Angelina River, for population and habitat factors, it really doesn't look that bad, but it's constrained by the abundance. So if the current abundance is low, um, then the overall condition estimate for the population is going to be low regardless of the habitat or water quality there. Uh, so the Texas heel splitter, um, a little bit worse off, you can tell, because we use the same, the same colors here. So there's no green, there's no yellow. Everything is in a low or um, extirbated, which an extirbated population just means it's extinct in that region. Um, so for the heel splitter in the, we, have, we don't have any heel splitters in the Angelina there, it's only in the Natchez, and that population is considered to be very low condition. Um, another species that we're looking at is the alligator snapping turtle. They're also found um, over the entire range of the Natchez River Basin. Um, they're currently listed as a threatened species in Texas, which means that in the state the species is protected, but their habitat is not necessarily protected. Um, their demographics and population size are not as well understood as those of the mussels, just because we're still in this, the research stage. Um, so Stephen F. Austin State University is conducting that study with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. They're basically wanting to see what, what the population looks like in Texas, whether it's more than one population or it's all the same population, um, where exactly the turtles are found. They're repeating a study that was done uh, several years ago, I think 20 or 30 years ago, so they're looking to see if there's been any change in the population over that time. Um, we are contributing this project with, well, a, a smaller campaign actually with Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, so we're looking to raise awareness about the, the threatened status of alligator snapping turtles in Texas. Um, a lot of people don't know that they're already protected here, so we're looking to um, basically get on, on the education outreach portion of that. And we're going to talk about chicken turtles, but I'm going to turn this screen over to Mandy to update you all on that. She's the expert there. You'll have to make her the presenter. And I'm going to make her the presenter because I'm in charge of that. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much. Can you guys hear me? Or are we all still muted? We can hear you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Okay, good. <laughs> I was just starting to look at all my audio setup to see if something changed. Yeah, I was talking into a, a muted phone. <laughs> no worries. This has been great. Thanks so much for inviting me, guys. I really appreciate it. 
I think I Yeah, I transferred um the presenter mode to you, Mandy. Do you want to okay. present or do you want us to pull up your presentation on our end? Um if you guys I mean you guys have it on your end, so if you guys just want to pull it up, I'm fine with that. I will transfer presenter back to us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so this is going to be a little bit different from uh, what everybody else has been presenting on today. Uh, we're doing a little bit less with water quality right now and doing a little bit more with uh, what we can do with these water samples. Um, so first off, thank you guys so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. I'm really excited to spread the word about the project. Um, this is something that we're working with the Texas Comptroller's Office of uh, Public Accounts for um, to look at the range of the western chicken turtle in Texas. And we're using kind of a, not, a more modern technique um, with this environmental DNA. And so essentially we're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack here um, with a species that's pretty cryptic. And since I'm not sure what everybody's background is on either western chicken turtles or environmental DNA, I've got a little bit of background information for you guys. If you want to move on to the next slide. Or can I do that for my end? I got you on this end. Thanks. Um, all right, so Western chicken turtles. My, my number one question that I get whenever I talk to people about the project for the first time is what the heck is a Western chicken turtle? Um, they're a smaller species that has a historic range that extends throughout all of East Texas. Um, and the Guadalupe River Basin has kind of been identified as the, the main boundary for where the species range stops. Um, they're typically found in ephemeral or depressional freshwater wetlands. So I know a lot of what you guys work in and what a lot of you guys um, discuss most of the time are these flowing streams and river systems. Um, but these are kind of more found on the fringe in those uh, wetlands that are often the riparian environment. Um, they, have, they have two things kind of going against them. They've got a shorter lifespan and a smaller population size. And so there's this potential for an increased perception of rarity with the species. And so there's a few groups in Texas, specifically the um, Texas A&M and College Station is doing some work with the species. There's a group out of West Texas A&M University up in Northeast Texas who's doing some work with it. And then a few other um, smaller groups, maybe for more class projects and whatnot with A&M Commerce and a few other places. Um, and we're all kind of pooling our efforts together to see if there really is truly this rarity here or if it's something that's more perceived with the species. Um, what Another thing that's kind of unique to these guys is that they exhibit a discrete seasonal activity pattern. So they're very active from about the March through June period. But then once we hit July and kind of those peak peak temperatures in the summer, they will bury themselves in the ground and actually stay underground for upwards of eight months before emerging again um, to get together and start nesting and whatnot. Um, so definitely some different behavioral and habitat kind of life history characteristics with these guys compared to other freshwater turtle species. Um, you can move on to the next one. So uh, Paul Crump, our state herpetologist, and then Brandon Bowers, who's a current graduate student at Texas A&M University, put together this great identification guide to help folks, you know, determine whether or not they're looking at a chicken turtle or another species. Um, some of the key characteristics with these is that they have an extraordinarily long neck compared to sliders and cooters. It'll be upwards of three quarters of their total body length. Um, they don't have any of the red ear that you see in a red ear slider or any of the kind of whorls or kind of little yellow patches that you might see in other freshwater um, species. And then the rim of the carapace can be rounded and, and has, it's kind of smooth and has this yellow tint to the edge of it. Um, in the back side, they have these kind of alternating black and yellow pants. Some people call them stripy pants. I like to call them pajama pants. Um, that's kind of a unique characteristic with that clear vertic or vertical barring on the hind side. Um, and then if you can see in that center image, this solid black line that is kind of in the middle of the bridge, which is the side of the shell, um, that's kind of unique to the species as well. 
Um, another thing that you might be able to observe from a distance if you're looking at turtles is those front legs. And so if you take a look in that rightmost image, the two front legs there have these really solid yellow bands that kind of come across the front. And so those are characteristic to this species. Other uh, freshwater dwelling species like sliders and cooters will either have uh, thin stripes or kind of punctuated markings. Um, it's the, the chicken turtles are the only ones that have these kind of broad bands. Um, and so a lot of people have probably actually seen these guys before, but not actually known what they're looking at. And I think that um, Paul and Brandon definitely did a good job putting this together, kind of highlighting those characteristics. So feel free to move on to the next one. All right, so that's kind of a background on Western chicken turtles. Um, you know, if you guys you think that you might be seeing them in your watersheds or even just recreationally out in the areas that you guys like to, to go out in and do work in or just kind of enjoy yourselves in, um, I would love to hear about some sightings or if you have any information. Because um, what we're doing now is we're kind of taking this needle in a haystack approach and we are using environmental DNA collection. And so I'm not sure how many of you guys are familiar with environmental DNA. So just as a background to it, this is a less invasive technique than traditional surveying or trapping methods. So hoop traps, peck nets, pitfall traps, these can be pretty invasive to not just the species by stressing them out when they're captured, but also to the habitat and the environment that they're set in. Um, this Environmental DNA has been used across a wide range of vertebrates, especially those really hard to find or cryptic species, um, very similar to kind of what the chicken turtle exhibits. And then it's, it's especially useful for the cryptic or seasonally active um, species in freshwater systems. So pretty much geared great towards trying to apply this to the Western chicken turtle. Um, and essentially all that this environmental DNA detection entails is collection of a water sample and then processing of that water sample against primers specific to the species uh, through PCR um, and genetic analyses. So we can move on. All right, so the goal of our study here is over the next year, maybe two years after this season, since we kind of got held up with COVID a little bit, um, is to sample 87 sites throughout the Western Chicken Turtles historic range. So it's a pretty monumental task through all of East Texas, but we're doing what we can. Um, we're using what's called a randomized site design. So we are looking at counties that are associated with historic accounts, and those historic accounts come from either VertNet, which is a repository for collection data, um, iNaturalist, which is a citizen scientist-based reporting uh, arena, and then, you know, just people who call us or contact us and let us know that they've seen them or may have pictures of them or, you know, may have seen them however long ago in their lifetime when they were kids and played with them. Um, we're also looking at counties without historic accounts so that we can kind of rule out those types of habitats or areas. And then we're using a variety of wetland types to uh, set up the site design from the National Wetland Inventory that's been created by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so, um, this figure that I have on here shows you kind of a, a brief snapshot of how this randomized site design is put together. And so each of those colored polygons within the circular areas represents wetlands that are within a five kilometer area of a historic account. And so each of those wetland types, we've weighted the number of sites that are randomly generated within those uh, wetland areas so that we can generate these random coordinates. And it's, it's essentially throwing a guided arrow or a guided dart at a board. Um, and then in conjunction, once we've actually identified our sites and our locations, we're using a combination of sample types, since this is a species that has not been analyzed for environmental DNA before, and we want to make sure that we're getting the best possible data that we can. Um, so we're taking what's called an ambient water sample, which you guys are pretty familiar with. Um, the only difference with our ambient water sampling for eDNA is that we are also collecting the surface scum because um, sometimes skin deposits or flakes can kind of float along the surface there. Um, we're doing what's called a resuspended sediment sample. So this is where we're actually agitating the substrate and then bringing it up into the water column with the thought that as um, larger pieces of material, shell, shell sloughings or even fecal matter may settle down to the bottom in these ephemeral non-flowing wetlands, 
um, you know, by resuspending it, we're bringing that DNA back into the water column. And then we're also incorporating some soil samples, especially in areas or during parts of the season when those wetlands have completely dried up. You can go ahead to the next one. All right, so up to now, we have been able to sample 27 sites. We conduct, we began sampling in March of 2020 when you all know what happened there. Um, but we have been able to successfully sample all 27 of these sites over the last four months, one time per month, so that that way we're maximizing our detection across their most active period of the season. Um, we've had positive eDNA detections for western chicken turtles at four of these 27 sites. So that's about 15% of our sites, which is fabulous news. That's way more than we already expected. Um, and this includes one site in the Neches Basin that is within uh, Alazan Bayou. So if you guys are working in that Alazan Bayou area, definitely keep an eye out. Um, and then we've also, in conjunction with the eDNA sampling, been doing some visual surveys using binoculars and you know, kind of walking along and seeing if we can find any just, you know, as, ch as chance encounters or whatnot. And so we've had nine observations of actual turtles through those visual surveys as well. You can move on. So our future directions here, um, we have 60 EA DNA sites that are remaining. This includes 12 that are within the Neches Basin. Um, and of course, all of these are going to be pending landowner access and approval. Um, we do have to backtrack with the county appraisal districts and find our landowners another needle in a haystack and then contact them and see if they'll allow us out to the property and so to work with us and be willing to allow us to take these samples. Um, but we do plan next season to intensify some of our efforts at the sites where we have had positive eDNA detections. Uh, we currently have a graduate student who is working on developing some protocols for UAV surveys, um, seeing if we can get some aerial imagery and identify individuals through aerial imagery. Um, we're going to incorporate some more of those traditional sampling techniques that I mentioned, so hoop traps, fight nets, basking traps. Um, and then we're also going to be potentially applying some remote sensing with game, cap, game trap cameras um, and a few other possible methods. Um, but this is kind of the site distribution that we're looking for in the next um, year. We may end up asking for an extension to carry over into 2022 just because of all the hangups that we had with COVID this year. But um, that's really kind of all I had for you guys. If you want to go to the next one, my contact information is on the last slide here. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to answer those. If you guys have any sightings, I'm more than happy to, to hear about those. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up, actually, I think it's in the chat box. There's a link to other, there, there's a question. Oh, we have a question. Hold on. Mandy. Yeah, we have a question for Mandy. It says, did the visual observations coincide with the eDNA hit? Yeah, absolutely. So every time we go, so we go out once a month for the past four months, every single time we go out there before we even collect the samples, we perform a visual survey. And so all, I would say actually seven of those nine sightings came from visual surveys. And then two of them came from walking surveys where we actually, you know, found them um, either a shell of a dead one or a living one. Um, so we have that information across all of the different months. And the sites where we have confirmed uh, Western chicken turtle presence through visual surveys are also the same sites that we have confirmed Western chicken turtle presence through eDNA. So it is pa it's it's pairing up much more beautifully than I could have expected. <laughs> are there any more questions? Um, oh, yeah. uh, we have one more question. It's does Anna anticipate getting involved in monitoring with mussels and turtles, or do we think that our involvement will stay more outreach focused? Um, right now, we're we're starting with the outreach, but we are um, we have been invited to attend uh, a training so that we we can learn how to sample for the alligator snapping turtles. Um, last year, before all this COVID, we attended or um, a muscle sampling event to kind of get a better idea of how all that works. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, the short answer is it's, it's kind of up in the air. We, we're trying to educate ourselves as much as possible and incorporate um, 
keeping our eyes open for a lot of these species when we're doing our routine CRP sampling. Uh, we have discussed doing some more intensive sampling for the muscle stuff, but it's pretty much we've come into the muscle stuff late in the game, um, and I think at this point the the listing they it seems pretty. Um, they're pretty late in the listing process already. Yeah, the the process for the mussels is already so far along, and the the way that Fish and Wildlife has to do these things is they have to lean towards conservation. So if there's a lack of data, then they almost are required to list a species. And so at this point, the data collection is it's almost certainly not going to end up factoring into the listing process because of how far along it is. The, we do have some concerns about the, the data that's out there. We think maybe the species are more um, plentiful than, than is reflected in the current data because we've, we've seen some data that, that indicates they may be looking in the wrong habitats for them. But that's going to be more of a factor in um, ongoing monitoring and species restoration efforts rather than w determining whether they get listed or not. So the short answer is that we're educating ourselves and we're making those decisions as we go. We don't have any firm decisions right now. But as Ali said, we are leaning into it. So we're, um, it is something that we're looking at and it, it, there is potential that we will be doing some sampling. Any more questions? Um, there's no more questions in the chat, so um, there's no raised hands. Okay. If nobody has anything else, I guess we will uh, go ahead and thank everybody for attending, and we'll shut it down. If anybody hasn't signed in, we ask that you please do sign in so we'll have a record. We'll send out the um, list of everybody that attended to everybody that signs in. If we have an email address for you, we'll include you on the, um, the email that goes out with the, the list of attendees. And uh, as I said, thanks for attending. We appreciate it. Hopefully next time we do this, we'll be able to do it in person. Mm -hmm. but Thank you all. Thanks, guys.